Hey everybody, uh, so I'll be talking about uh, iatrogenic ureteral injuries, uh, specifically intraoperative uh, evaluation and management. So this is from the EAU uh, trauma guidelines. We're just doing this part, so none of this stuff. We'll talk about the epidemiology, prevention, evaluation, and then some surgical options, stent versus repair. So starting with epidemiology, The study is a little bit out of date, but I think it kind of gets the point across. So most of the injuries are distal and mostly from pelvic surgery, be it us, colorectal or gynecology. Um, big spike here is actually from uh, endoscopy back when we kind of first started doing it, which is kind of out of the scope of this. But basically the point being most of these are distal and from pelvic surgery. Um, the other thing to highlight is about 64% of them, at least in this series, and, and that's about the same across other papers we looked at here. Um, they aren't diagnosed until later, and that's pretty important. We'll go over why. So next topic is prevention. Um, so prevention is just other than, I mean, prevention is meticulous dissection, but prevention in terms of how we study it is whether stenting actually helps, and we're all pretty familiar with that process. Um, I looked at two studies. This one is a systematic review in the colorectal surgery literature. And you can see they there's six studies they looked at with pulled results. Um, four of them actually reported odds ratios that were comparable or that could be compared to each other. And it's kind of a split decision. So uh, in terms of whether or not stents um, prevent injury, these are obviously imperfect studies in the sense that, you know, if, if you're getting a stent, it's probably a more complex surgery. Therefore, there might be, it might be harder to also injure the ureter. There are other different considerations. Some people think the, the stent actually decreases like the normal kind of compliance of the ureter. So it's not no longer a moving target and it kind of stays there and is more rigid. So you're more likely to hit it. Um, but in terms of just pure data, this shows it does not prevent injury. Um, it is still recommended by the EAU trauma guidelines here. So preoperative prophylactic stents, they say, do not prevent ureteral injury. However, they may assist in its detection. And so they do recommend it in high-risk cases. And this is the study they cite. Um, and it's not explicitly said, but what you can tell from the data is basically um, there were, they found in this study, they found two mild thermal injuries in the non-catheterized group and eight thermal injuries uh, in the catheterized group identified intraoperatively. And the number of injuries identified after the fact are all in non or mostly in the non-catheterized group. And so you can surmise that this basically helps you find things in the OR. And, uh, and it's important because of this next topic. So uh, we'll move on to evaluation. So we all probably recognize these types of images. Uh, diagnosis in the OR, first after direct inspection is with uh, fluoroscopic studies. Uh, this study on the left here is extrav on a left retrograde right here. Uh, this was a lumbar disc operation. And the second one was uh, a crash C-section. And so you can see here, there's cutoff on the left side. Uh, the right side's patent, and that's also important because you want to check both sides oftentimes. Um, so a couple questions for the consulting service. What surgery is being done, obviously? Um, what approach? Uh, so transvaginal, transabdominal, open, laparoscopic, et cetera. And then what position they're in. That's just to kind of figure out what you need and, and what access you have. Um, which side? And then whether the patient's stable. And then we kind of just went over this. Oh, the other two things I would mention are, you know, methylene blue and fluorescein, which we've kind of talked about. <clears throat> Another quick trick some people mention is if the patient had a recent CT with IV, um, you can try single shot, but um, it's apparently it's false negative in up to 60% of patients. So it's really only good for like ruling out the injury if you see contrast all the way down. But if you don't, it doesn't really tell you anything. Um, so grading the injury, uh, the... A AST group actually gave grades and the other groups, AUA and EAU, basically describe these, but they don't assign Roman numerals. numerals. Um, but basically a one is just a hematoma or something that doesn't have an actual laceration. If it's less than 50%, it's a two. And if it's greater than 50%, it's a three. And four and five are just a lot worse. Um, basically, everybody says the first two grades can heal with just a stent. Um, and everything else probably needs to be repaired surgically. <clears throat> so stent versus repair, we kind of just mentioned that um, it's actually kind of hard just to find 
papers that looked at just, you know, how often stenting alone works for intraoperative um, injuries um, because it happens. So it's a tiny portion of any big, uh, you know, study that looks at, you know, they'll look at 50 years and it'll be maybe a hundred cases. Um, but in most of the studies, you can, you can kind of look and note that of the patients who get intra, an uh, intraoperative diagnosis of injury, you can see a lot of them get stented. Let's say, yeah, 33% get stented. Most of them don't go on to needing a second procedure surgery. So, you know, all these studies, they don't track these patients one-to-one, -one, like they don't say, you know, how many of the actual patients were stented are in this group here. Um, delayed diagnosis equals more surgery. I think it ends up being like an average of 1.6 to 1 point, like to two surgeries needed to establish a real continuity if the diagnosis happens outside of the OR versus if you find it right away, it's, it's closer to just one procedure and that includes a stent. Um, so if you find it intraoperatively, unless you're stenting it, you should be repairing it immediately unless the patient is unstable, say in like a trauma X lab situation. And that's all three societies. Um, we kind of talked about this, uh, the larger thermal grade two injuries are kind of tough to suss out because a lot of the damage is delayed. So you can't necessarily tell. Um, so if there's any doubt, it's probably better to just debride, get a clean edge and then repair over stent. Okay. Surgical options. So these are all pretty, I think most people are familiar with these. So I'll just go over some pictures because those are always kind of fun to look at. Um, so distal repair, basically a reimplant is the way to go. Um, and the reason people moved away from just primary UU is the distal injuries. People think it hurts the blood supply a lot more. And when you do an actual reimplant like this, you're incorporating a lot more collateral flow from the bladder. There's not a lot of consensus on refluxing versus non-refluxing, but we'll go over some refluxing pictures because they looked kind of cooler. Um, you'll have fully for about a week, plus or minus drain and a stent for about six weeks is what um, the guidelines said. But obviously a lot of that is up to the discretion of the clinician. So if you need more length, you can do a vesicoso as hitch. And so we'll go over like a series of pictures about that. So this is the ureteral exposure step. That's the ureter right there. Um, you want to try to stay extra peritoneal if you can and preserve the adventitious. You can see there's a nice generous um, bunch of tissue around it. Um, so here we've ligated the ureter on purpose. Usually if we're being called for this, this has already happened, not on purpose. Um, so you'll tag it and you'll ligate the distal, don't forget to ligate the distal stump. Um, and then you want to continue to preserve the adventitious around it for blood supply. When you start mobilizing a bladder, this is a picture where they've filled it and that makes it a lot easier to move around and mobilize. And you might ligate the urethral, the urethus. Um, or these other ligaments in order to gain more mobility. And that can include um, pedicle ligation on the other opposite side. And basically you want no tension on that anastomosis, which will happen about two to three centimeters above the common iliac. At this point, if you're really doing this intraoperatively also, it's pretty time consuming, but you got to do what you got to do. Um, so I, I've actually, I mean, I've seen a couple of these and this, I haven't seen it done this way, but basically the, this group actually advocates um, uh, cystotomy like this. Um, and then they'll actually, and this is just a hitch, not um, the uh, Bori flat. And then they'll actually put a finger inside the bladder and push it all the way up to where they want it to go. Um, and then tack it there. And obviously you're trying to avoid the genitofemoral nerve, which I think they're showing this yellow line here. Um, parallel bite bites can can help you avoid that as well. And then they also want you to tie it later because um, you want to first establish your tunneling, which is this step. Put four stay sutures in the corners and you stretch them out to kind of identify your trajectory and you're aiming for about four to five centimeters. You pull the ureter through, um, tie it down. And then at this point, you can tie down your psoas sutures. Uh, and then you finish up maturing the neo ureteral orifice and you close your everything else, all the other layers. And then in this paper, they actually placed a stent and brought it out to skin and an SP tube brought out to skin. Um, a lot of people don't do that, obviously, maybe just at most an SP tube, um, but they really like their drainage in this case. Has anyone done it like this before? Stent externalized? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, finish your closure. And then a flap, 
the, a lot of these pictures are kind of the same, but basically this flap is raised, you know, instead of an oblique incision, you're actually raising the entire flap with one pedicle on one side. Um, same steps here, tunnel again, you have more length and basically you've t inverted and tub tubularized um, a length of bladder. And they've got some crazy pictures later on. I'll show you where the, these things can reach up pretty high. Um, so outcomes are pretty good. This is one study of 100 patients and about 81% of resolution of pre-op hydro, and they followed them for you know over two years. Um, sorry, I can't do math. That's four years. Um, and then uh, here's another one, 97% success rate, also about four and a half years. So proximal to mid, you might be forced to do a primary UU, and we kind of talked about why you, you know we don't do that unless we have to. Um, and to end anastomosis, and you're speculating probably a lot more than this picture is showing. So we'll skip that one. Trans UU, a little bit more interesting. So you're tunneling the donor ureter under the mesentery of the sigmoid, um, and then doing an end to side anastomosis to the recipient, the recipient being the undamaged side. Here are some cool retrogrades. So this is a pretty long stricture. You can't really see any ureter on the left. And then this is the trans UU over here. Um, so it's not quite as successful. The complication rate is 24%, pretty high. Um, basically a one in 10 chance of having a leak, um, and a one in 10 chance of needing another procedure. And that's with the mean follow-up of six years. And so it's really not your first line choice, but it's fun to talk about. All right. Also fun to talk about is the bowel interposition. So if you're losing it, if you've lost a big segment, you can usually take the ileum, um, have a couple papers about that. Oh, first, here's an image. So this is a retrograde. This is before, no ureter, after, big um, ileal ureter. So a couple papers, uh, the first one from our own Dr. Chung. Um, outcomes, about 20% complication rate in this series, so pretty high. And they did, I think, a combination. Most of them were ileum, but there are a couple of others. Let's see, we got it. Um, do we have it here? I think they used a couple uh, colons as well. So you want to avoid these, uh, doing these in patients with impaired renal function, known intestinal disease, all the sort of usual stuff. You want to make sure they're not developing hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis and following them with labs. 3% um, stricture rate, 6% fistula rate from this other series. And that's with 91 patients. So also fun to talk about, but kind of hard to actually pull off. A um, couple honorable mentions at the end. This is a downward nephropexy. So you take the kidney and you mobilize it and move it down. This is the crazy picture I'm talking I mean, okay, this is a diagram, so they could have just drawn it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but theoretically, these authors think this represents how much length you can get with a nice flap. I mean, this is like, this is almost to the UPJ. So that's pretty impressive. Um, and yeah, I, I found like one series of 18 patients. Uh, this one's pretty interesting. So you can just move the kidney completely all the way down instead of just a little bit, really do it. You have to take the hilum with you, unfortunately, and put it into the iliacs. Um, so there's one series of seven patients from Dr. Mang and Stoller. Um, and then another one, this one's kind of interesting. So these were bilateral renal transplantations actually for pediatric patients with intractable stone disease and recurrent colic. So it was just happening so much and they couldn't do anything about it. Um, so basically they just plugged the kidneys directly into the bladder like this. You've got like these inverted pantyhose looking, this kind of configuration and the stones, I guess, ostensibly just dump right out. And they did that to 15 children. Um, I don't think they had any like real outcomes or follow-up um, to like that you could really... Um, say much about. All right. So, uh, buccal graft ureteroplasty is the last one I'll mention. So with, uh, from Dr. Li Zhao. So this is the graft right here. This is the big segment. What is that? Like five centimeters almost of ureter. Uh, you open it open. It looks like they didn't actually transect the entire, the entire, um, segment, but just open it up longitudinally. And then you can sew the buccal flap along to it. Um, this paper said out of, well, like it's, 19 patients, but um, they say their success rate was 90%, which is pretty impressive. And okay, key takeaways. Where am I at? 16 minutes. All right. Um, so pre op stenting might improve detection of injury, but it does not prevent it. So you still want to consider it for high risk cases. 
Um, delayed repair of injury is less effective and requires more procedures, so you should do it right away when you find it, unless the patient is unstable. Um, you can't go back and repair an injury in a patient who's passed away. Grade one and select grade two injuries are very likely to heal with conservative management. Um, so you can stent it uh, if, you know, you just got to make really make sure, especially if there's thermal injury. So, you know, monopolar wide radius, you want to make sure you really debreed all the stuff or, I mean, that there isn't um, so much ureter burned away that it'll die. And hold on. Um, and then and then the rest is just a summary of um, the surgical options. But if you have more significant injuries, uh, the repair method basically depends on the injury location and the extent and with a preference towards reimplants, plus or minus lengthening procedures. And then if you really have to do some of the fancy stuff, um, if that's the only option, then we talked about those. That's it. These are the papers I looked at. Everybody got that? All right. That's it.